Inside this box is a Remington rolling block rifle. I already have a Swedish rolling block, and I enjoy shooting it so much that I've been casually looking around for another type of rolling block, and that's when I saw an auction with quite a few of them. One in particular caught my eye because it had a few features that are unique to one specific model, but it wasn't described as such. The description was generic, highlighting the markings and the condition, but nothing about the exact model, only that it was a 50 caliber. I ended up bidding, and luckily I was the only bidder, so I got it for the opening bid. If it is what I think it is, there's a few identifying features. The extra tall hammer. Most rolling blocks have a hammer that stops about here. There's checkering in a shield outline on the hammer and the breech block lever. There should be a cartouche on the stock here. I can't make out what it says, but there is something here. There's a hole ahead of the trigger guard for a sling loop. It's missing, but the hole is there. The forend has three barrel bands held on by springs, with a cap at the front. Taking a rough measurement of the bore, it's approximately 0.510. And finally, the function will confirm what this is. I'll bring out the Swede to demonstrate how a rolling block should function. The hammer is cocked back, the breech block opened, a round loaded, then the breech block is closed, then the rifle is ready to fire. This one should operate a little differently. The cocking of the hammer is the same, but something happens when the breech block is opened all the way. As I close it, watch the hammer. And there it is. It drops slightly. Sources out there say this is a half cock position, but it's actually something closer to three quarter cock. To fire the rifle, the hammer must be recocked slightly. This is an extra safety function specified by the New York State Militia. And that's what this rifle is, a model of 1871 New York State Militia rifle. I saw the extra tall hammer on the auction listing and took a gamble on it. In 1871, the New York State Militia ordered just under 20,000 of these rifles through two contracts. They're chambered in 5070 government. Other identifying features are unit markings on the top of the butt plate, though they look to be worn away here. On the rear tang is a three-line Remington marking. This type of marking dates the rifle to the first New York contract. The rear sight is a stepped ladder sight, and the front is a small half moon. The cleaning rod is the correct type. Overall, it's a complete example of a relatively rare rifle. However, the condition leaves a bit to be desired. Most pressing is what's preventing me from heading to the range right now, and that's the condition of the buttstock. There's chunks of wood missing from the heel. That's not a big deal, but what is, is that there's a gap between the butt plate and the wood. I can try and light through it. This may be what caused these chunks to break off in the first place. The wood must have shrunk over the years as it dried out, because at the front there's a gap as well. It's not enough to shine light through, but a 12 thousandths feeler gauge easily fits in there. The fit at both ends should be tight in order to transmit recoil from the action to the shooter. Otherwise it can cause cracks, which can be seen here on the top. and here on the bottom. I'll remove the buttstock, disassembling the rifle as I inspect it. With the buttstock off, I can see the closest thing to a serial number on this rifle. It's matching between the trigger plate and the receiver. 
Now I'll remove the three bands, which are held on by springs. And then the fore end comes off. The thin wings that surround the barrel have numerous cracks throughout. It's not until about the third band that it's solid. I think that's just due to wear and how thin the wood is, but more evidence of wood shrinkage is shown with the fit of the barrel lug. It should be a tight fit, but age and wear have caused this to loosen up just like the buttstock. Next up, I'll disassemble the action starting with the pin retaining plate. The hammer spring is very heavy, so the correct way to disassemble a rolling block action is to remove the breech block first. The pin wiggles out. Then the breech block can be removed. This model has a rotary extractor. Then the hammer can be carefully released to ease the spring tension. And then the pin comes out. Next is the trigger plate, which is held on by two screws. This mechanism is unique to the New York model. There's two levers on either side of the trigger. This spring I think is for the rotary extractor. On the other side, you can see that the longer lever isn't directly connected to the trigger. I can do a full video on how this works if anyone is interested. But everything looks to be in good condition. It just needs oil when reassembling. The one exception is this screw, which has the slot damaged. However, it came out easily enough, and there doesn't seem to be any excess metal to peen back into shape. I'll leave it be. The rear sight, though, that does have an issue that needs to be addressed. These ears were squeezed inwards, making it hard to flip up the sight ladder. Also, the ladder itself is bent. It should be straight. I'll move the action to the vise to fix these issues, starting with the sight base. It looks like this ear on the left is bent inwards and needs to be pushed out. The right one is perfectly vertical. Before resorting to a punch, I'll give these pliers wrenches a shot. And that did the trick. It's always best to try methods that you have better control over first. Next I'll get the sight ladder back into shape, which involves taking it off first. This clamp takes the spring tension off of the pen, allowing it to be driven out easier. Light taps ensure that the pin isn't lost when it's finally out. Because it's so misshapen, I'll need to remove the slider. I'll be sure to not lose these tiny screws.
to reform this, I'll be using the vise to squeeze it flat again. But instead of the serrated jaws on the vise, I'll use these steel bars with tape on them so as to not scratch the sight. With them sandwiched in the vise, I'll squeeze them together. It looks like this still has a slight bend close to the pin. I'll squeeze it again focused on that area. It's better. Still slightly bent, but I think I can live with it like this. Getting it perfectly straight would involve bending it past flat, so that it springs back flat. That's risky, because if I don't put the bend in the exact spot that it's needed, it'll end up wavy like it started as. Now to get the site back together. I drove the pin out the way I did because this end is slightly peened over. I'll place the other end in the sight base. Using the clamp again will help align the sight ladder and ease the spring tension. These pliers wrenches come in handy again when driving pins. There is much less risk of damage than with a hammer and a punch. And once the pin is through the ladder and into the other side of the sight base, I can remove the clamp and press it all the way. Now the sight functions and looks a lot better than it did before. Next up is the bore condition. Old black powder rifles like this rarely have mint bores, so I'm not expecting much. Turns out that it's not too bad. The rifling is distinct throughout. I'll clean this up and see if I can get it to look any better. I'll use hoppies in a 20 gauge wire brush. I don't have a 50 cal brush, and anyway when cleaning old rifles for the first time, I like to use an oversized brush to knock out any dirt, grime, or rust. After a few passes, I'll run some cloth patches down the bore. It might be a little bit brighter than before, but it's not too noticeable. Like I said, with these old black powder rifles you can't expect much. All things considered, this is a pretty decent bore. Now that the metal parts have been fully inspected, and in the case of the rear sight, fixed, 
I can turn my attention to fixing the stock. It looks like there's two main cracks. This one in the middle goes all the way down to the comb. And on the bottom, it's about the same length. This crack off to the side goes down alongside the upper tang to the screw. I don't see it going past it. And the same on the bottom. Both of these will need to be fixed in order to prevent future damage. To do that, I'll put the stock in the vise and start by cleaning the oils and the grime out of the stock with acetone. This will ensure the epoxy that I'll use to stabilize the cracks can fully bond with the wood. I'm going to use a technique that involves hydraulics to push the epoxy deep within the cracks. Here I'm chiseling a starting point on each crack for a drill bit. The clamp holds the cracks closed and the stock together. Then it's time to drill. I'll be very careful to follow the crack without the bit exiting the side of the wood. The bigger crack I want to drill just down past the screw hole to ensure that the epoxy is pushed deep within the crack. The dowel will be used as a ram in the hole to push the epoxy down within the crack and hopefully out the ends. I was originally going to use a dowel for each crack, but looking at it now they're too close together. I'll glue the smaller of the two using traditional methods. I'll stand up the stock in the vise so gravity works to pull the epoxy down. For the epoxy, I'm using Acroglass Original. The original is thin and will flow much easier than the thicker gel would. The directions call for a 4 to 1 mix, which I'm approximating. A drop of black dye will help hide the repair if any epoxy shows. Then I'm ready to glue. Actually, I should fill the smaller of the two cracks first. I'll remove the clamp to be able to fill it with epoxy and work that down. Then after adding back on the clamp, I'll clean up any of the squeeze out. To support within the tang, I made this small block shaped as a slight wedge that I'll fit in. After adding more epoxy to the hole, I'll add the dowel, coating it in epoxy, and using it to work it through. Before it's seated all the way, 
I'll add some more epoxy through the tang hole screw to ensure that it gets pushed all the way through. Then I can hammer the dowel all the way. It's hard to tell, but I can see some epoxy squeezing out of this crack. Not so much here, but I'm confident that this will be a strong repair. The last thing to do is to make my life easier on by cleaning up any excess epoxy. Now I'll turn my attention to the fore end. There's a few small cracks on the right side. This one above the middle band. And this longer one here. Since these cracks are in thinner areas of wood, I don't need the runniness of the regular acker glass. I'll use the gel instead. And to support the fore end as the epoxy cures, I'll be using the barrel. This release agent will ensure that the epoxy doesn't stick to it. The acroglass gel calls for a one-to-one -one mix, which is easier to approximate. Again, I'll add a drop of black dye. I won't use acetone to clean the wood before gluing. With where the cracks are, I think I'd run the risk of ruining the wood's finish, which I want to try and preserve as much as possible. To get the epoxy in the cracks, I'll carefully wedge them open, and then push the epoxy in. This crack is especially difficult since it's in the middle, and neither end exits the wood, which is unusual. This smaller crack is much easier to push epoxy into, since I can just lift up on it. Before leaving this to cure, I'll remove any excess epoxy from the inside, and more importantly, the outside. I'll wipe it down once more. Then to hold the cracks closed and everything in place, I'll wrap an exercise band around the whole fore end. I'm pulling it as I go, and I'm wrapping it around this way so that it will pull the cracks closed. At the end, I'll tuck it in, and then leave this and the stock for a few days to cure. I always save some of the leftover epoxy so I can check if it's hardened, and it has, and the buttstock looks good. Now to remove the wedge and saw off the rest of the dowel. Then I'll clean it up a bit. I'll also clean up the inlaying of any excess epoxy, and then the screw hole as well. Now I can unwrap the exercise band on the fore end. The fore end is solid now. 
I don't feel any movement in the cracks. Now to see if the release agent did its job and I'm able to separate the wood from the metal. And it did. It just needs to be peeled off now. When reassembling, I'll address the fit of the wood to the metal. The fore end was able to slide back and forth a bit. I want it tight instead. I cut the shim from thin cardboard. There's a dab of grease on the back to hold it in position while I add the fore end. And that's much better. To hold it on, I'll add back on the three barrel bands. Continuing reassembly, I'll add the action internals. I'll make sure everything has a light coat of gun oil on it to ensure that it's free to move. Reassembling is opposite disassembly and starts with the trigger plate. It's tricky since the hammer spring needs to be under the cross support within the receiver. Once the front screw is added, the spring can be compressed. Then the hammer can be added. cocked back. Then the breech block added. With the New York model I'm compressing the spring for the extractor and the spring for the hammer safety. With the action back together, I'll test the function. It seems to be working as expected. These actions are pretty simple, but it's still a good idea to test. Last is to add the stock. The fit between the stock and the action needs a shim as well. I added wood glue to a thicker piece of cardboard than previously. The glue will dry and hold it in place for now. Though it will stay on, it isn't a permanent fix. I can easily break it off if I decide to epoxy bed the stock later on. But for now, it's important to have something to take up space between the receiver and the stock so as to not create more cracks in the wood. I'll wipe away any excess glue with water.
there was one more gap under the butt plate. I'll add another cardboard shim here, again with a small amount of wood glue to hold it in place. I thought about repairing the chip at the top of the butt plate, but it would require new wood to be spliced on, and it would only be cosmetic, not structural, so I decided to leave it as is. The shims can be cut to better fit the wood later on, after the glue has dried. But with that, here's the reassembled New York State rolling block, ready for its test shoot. I'm doing something a bit different with this one, and I'm covering how to load 5070 government for it with a separate video. Look out for that one soon, but to continue on with this, let's head to the range. The rifle shot well. Again, look out for the other video for more information on the 5070 I loaded. I'll link it in the description when it's out. As far as accuracy goes, all 10 rounds fired hit the target stand, only 4 in the circle, but I was shooting more for function, not accuracy. There weren't any keyholes, which is good. Again, I'm happy with how the rifle performed. I didn't have any issues with the action. It was as smooth as any other rolling block. I even remembered to recock the hammer after closing the breech block each time. The stock repair seemed to have held up, though more than 10 rounds are needed for a thorough test, especially on the butt stock. However, I'm confident that this will hold up long term. That's due to these shims that I added, which seem to have done their job to remove any gaps between the metal and the wood. I'm on the fence whether I want to attempt a repair here, on the heel of the stock. I'd also address the fit of the butt plate, potentially replacing this shim with epoxy bedding. If I do, I'll be sure to film it. But for now, I'm very happy with this rifle. It cleaned up well, shot very nicely, and most important of all, it's better preserved for the future. Thanks for watching.